Alright, so today's video is probably going to be a little bit later than usual. I don't know if I'll post it late at night or early in the morning. I haven't quite decided on that just yet. I had some other things to take care of which kept me preoccupied there for a while. But I do apologize for the delay because we do have some things to talk about today as we head into the weekend. Dragon's Dogma 2, of course, just launched. This is one of the most hyped games of 2024. And you might think with its positive critical reviews, gamers are probably pretty happy right now. I mean, that's what you would think, right? But no, that's not actually the case. Instead, it's filled with controversy and even some disappointment. I'll explain why here in a little bit, and then we'll also discuss some new Xbox hardware as rumors continue to light up, and potentially what's next for them in 2024. And then we also got an update on the Yuzu Suyu Nintendo situation. Yeah, that's a whole thing and everything, but uh, let's just go and get right into the video, starting off with Final Fantasy 16. Rebirth isn't the only new Final Fantasy content for 2024, and in fact, it's actually a pretty stacked year for you Final Fantasy fans out there. 14 is now available on Xbox, which that's pretty cool to see. Then there's the Dawn Trail expansion set for later this year, and now Final Fantasy 16 will be getting some new DLC next month on April 18th. So go and mark your calendars for that. It's titled Rising Tide, and as you can see here, it will be $20, or you can go ahead and get the discounted expansion for $25, and that'll also include Echoes of the Fallen as well. Rising Tide, though, will include a brand new chapter set before the end of the game. Unfortunately, they don't plan to expand on its conclusion. If you've already played 16, you might know what I'm talking about, but what we will get here is a brand new location, some new threats, and we'll also uncover the secrets of the Leviathan. Now, this DLC will also launch side by side with a free update. They are upping the level cap. It'll have some new skill set features, and there's also tone correction and plus plenty, plenty more. So if you enjoyed Final Fantasy 16, as I very much did, well, then April 18th seems like a pretty good time to jump back in. I will be interested to see if the PlayStation 5 Pro, though, can fix some of its performance issues, which still hasn't been addressed on the standard PlayStation 5. Now, let's go and talk about Capcom and this entire Dragon's Dogma situation, though. I think when you look at what's happening, this is uh, a bit of a surprising twist from what was expected as of just, like, two days ago. I mean, just a mere two days ago, Dragon's Dogma 2 was being lauded as a Game of the Year contender. Critics absolutely adore this game, but now that it's actually in the hands of fans... Uh, well, they're not exactly too happy right now. Now, on the positive side of things here, Dragon's Dogma 2 has gotten off to a very fast start. Commercially, it's been a big success so far. Now, with the word of mouth, I'm not so sure how that's going to stack up in a couple months from now, but currently, it is a big commercial success. It's already enjoying the best launch for any single-player Capcom game ever made on Steam, or at least according to its peak concurrent players. It's already reached a 200,000 peak high, which is absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. That beats out the Resident Evil 4 remake, which is, you know, just one of the best games that you're going to play, period. Unfortunately, though, even though Dragon's Dogma 2 is enjoying a big-time launch, it hasn't exactly been successful in terms of fan reception. Currently, as of this recording, it only has a 42% approval rate on Steam, which is honestly kind of atrocious, especially for a AAA $70 title. So, you might ask, why is there this huge divide between what critics and fans think about this game? Well, what's happening here, and, and this really kind of seems to boil down to three different things that are maybe kind of loosely connected to some degree. Uh, one, and we've already extensively talked about this before, fans aren't thrilled about its optimization. A lot of people are struggling to hit that 60 frames mark and it's pretty bad at points. And some people are even reporting crashes as well as bugs and similar things like that. So it's not necessarily a great experience in that regard. And this also leads us to its next big complaint. Capcom once again decided to include the infamous Denuvo. Yeah, good old Denuvo is back at it once again. Now, the thing about Denuvo is that, you know, this is an anti-piracy and anti-cheat measure, which, okay, that's fine. But the problem that people have with Denuvo is that it negatively affects performance in games. So here you have Dragon's Dogma 2, which is already suffering from performance problems. That's been well documented even before its release. And I'm sure that Denuvo is 
you know, only going to make things worse. It's pretty easy to understand why fans hate Denuvo and why fans are also upset with it being included in Dragon's Dogma 2. Now, the third issue here, and this is probably garnering the most attention currently, despite Dragon's Dogma 2 being a $70 single-player title, it also has, yep, microtransactions. This includes various things such as character customization stuff, resurrection items, and even new fast travel locations. Yeah, fast travel behind a microtransaction, that one seems to be the most strange and egregious out of all of the bunch. So fans are actually furious about this situation, and it seems like critics have kind of gotten caught into the crossfire here. I've seen a lot of people online ask, why didn't reviewers highlight this? I mean, clearly this game reviewed well, it was being lauded as a Game of the Year contender, but seemingly critics didn't actually mention things like microtransactions, so why? Is what a lot of fans are asking. Well, from what I've gathered here, what seems to have happened here is that Capcom did send out a review guideline which included this information, but not every reviewer or a lot of reviewers seemingly just did not catch on. Now, I have, however, seen several people online claim that, you know, people are just kind of overreacting to this situation, that it's really not that big of a deal at all because these microtransactions are kind of unnecessary. And I've even seen some people say that they didn't even know that they were in the game at all. You can even compare them to other Capcom games because they've actually been doing this for a while now. But they've never really received this amount of backlash, and that is something to kind of think about. They did it in Resident Evil 4 as one such example, and for that matter, I, I do believe they did this in the original Dragon's Dogma as well. I think that that did also include microtransactions when it first launched, and then they were later on removed. Correct me if I'm wrong about all that, but it is interesting that Dragon's Dogma 2 is the one that fans are the most angry about. I mean, again, we've seen this in other Capcom games, including the recent Resident Evil 4, but I think what's happening here is that it's just kind of the combination of issues that we're seeing. See, the thing about Resident Evil 4 is that I think people were maybe a little bit more willing to overlook those microtransactions because it was, you know, still a very good and polished game. Whereas Dragon's Dogma 2, on the other hand, fans are dealing with a number of different issues, so they're going to point out all of those different problems in their reviews. What I'll definitely say here is that I, I do think some of these microtransactions raises an eyebrow, especially with the fast travel. That that one seems strange to kind of lock behind a paywall, uh, and, and I think that's also another reason why this is catching a lot of attention. It's almost like they're trying to see what they can get by with selling and what they can't. I'll ask you all, though, does these microtransactions bother you, or do you think it's just no big deal? I've really seen two stances on this subject, one group that doesn't seem to be all that bothered by it because they're not necessary to play the game, whereas there's this other group that claims that if you give developers an inch, they're going to take a mile. So let me know where you all stand on this issue, but either way, Capcom did respond to the criticism. In a statement, they mentioned that they're investigating its crashes and bugs, and that they are working on a performance fix. They said this problem is linked to it being CPU intensive, but they are looking at ways to improve its performance in the future. Hopefully they'll figure that out, but in the meantime, yeah, its performance will likely be rough on most platforms. Moving on though, we do need to talk about Nintendo and their vendetta against Switch emulators, or in this case against Yuzu, and maybe even possibly the replacement, Suyu. Suyu essentially is Yuzu's source code rebranded to poke fun at Nintendo for suing Yuzu. I'm not exactly sure if that was necessarily a good idea or not, and that certainly is important to this topic because reportedly, Suyu on GitHub was hit by a DMCA strike. Now, currently we're unaware if this was Nintendo that filed the DMCA strike, and while they're the most obvious culprit here because, you know, they're probably not exactly thrilled about this situation, but there has since been a development that might actually say that Nintendo isn't the one that filed this strike. The DMCA email was posted online, and you can see it here. This is coming from GitLab, and they said that we have determined that you forked a public repo against which we previously received a DMCA notice. If you would like to regain access to your account, you are required to delete the following project from your account. Once you agree to these terms, you will have 24 hours to remove the content. We've included the details of the DMCA takedown request below. Now, what this seems to mean is that GitLab themselves decided to take Suyu down because it's linked to a project that was already hit with a DMCA. Think of it this way. 
if you were banned from a website, you can't simply make another account on a lot of these sites. A lot of the times they'll track down your IP and ban your new account as well because you already broke their rules. And in this case, Yuzu broke the rules and they're now keeping that source code off of their website, regardless of who else submits it. It really kind of seems like they're protecting themselves to an extent, regardless of who else submits it. So with that in mind, there's definitely no guarantee that Nintendo filed this specific DMCA themselves, and you can actually make a case that it was GitLab themselves. However, there has since been an update by Suyu, which states that I have got a response from our legal team. We will need to use a different website in the foreseeable future. Getting our GitLab back most likely needs us to go through a lawsuit, which is going to be very difficult. We need to adapt, rewrite our CI for the new Git. Thanks for your understanding. So Suyu is actually back for the time being, but it is still a rather interesting situation. The fact that this is linked to Yuzu, which I believe Nintendo now owns, I do kind of wonder if Nintendo can just follow DMCA whenever they want. I'm not exactly sure how all that will play out, but it definitely seems like Suyu is swimming in murky waters here. And again, you know, the fact that they're poking fun at Nintendo I mean, I'm sure Nintendo has them on the radar right now, and, you know, if they can find a way to take it down, I'm, I'm sure that they will. This really continues to be an evolving story, though, and something tells me that we're not quite finished talking about it yet. Now, one last thing. Let's go and talk about Xbox and their hardware division. I think by this point, we all kind of understand that Xbox has had an up and down year. On one side, they have a very exciting upcoming first party lineup of games. They have games like Hellblade 2. They have Avowed coming this year. Indiana Jones, that's a rather big one, as well as some other games that's currently in the works. But most of the conversation for Xbox so far this year has been about their new business plans. The decision to port some of their games to PlayStation and Nintendo. Now, the jury is still out and whether or not that was a good decision. We'll kind of see about all that. But certainly, it's raised a lot of questions. And I think specifically when it comes to their hardware division. Interestingly, though, Xbox might actually release new hardware as early as 2024. More on that here in just a second. But first, let's go and take a look at a leak by the highly accurate Bill Bill Coon. So according to him, Xbox is set to release a new controller design next month in April. This is the Nocturnal Vapor design, which seems to resemble Mass. Master Chief to some degree. I actually think this one looks pretty good. I mean, Xbox, they really do make some fantastic looking controllers. And, you know, as a bonus here, you should be able to customize it on the Xbox Labs website. I mean, you can have your own opinion on the Xbox, but they, they do know how to handle their controllers, if anything else. Uh, what's even more interesting about all this, though, is that it has been pointed out that this could be the last new controller design before the leaked Xbox controller redesign. This is assumed to be more similar to the PlayStation 5 DualSense with its haptic feedback, and all this leaked out during the FTC trial. Now, plans may have changed since then, but originally it was planned for a May 2024 release with a $70 price tag. Now, I'd be surprised if that information is still 100% accurate, but what I think could happen here is that during their June showcase, they could reveal this new Xbox redesigned controller alongside the rumored brand new Xbox Series SKU. Now, how much they've changed all of those plans, that'll be very interesting to see. But it is something to definitely keep your eyes open for because some new Xbox hardware could very much be on the way sometime in the nearest future. I know for me personally, I'm actually very interested in that controller redesign as I do like haptic feedback. Anyways, though, that's going to be it for this episode. Again, I do apologize for it being a little later than usual, but I do hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and until next time, peace out.